I learned about sex from my uncle through, at first it was por pornographic magazines and videos and then it moved into uh, him sexually offending me. My uncle at that point was like the greatest person in the world to me. Um, you know, he was he was like, you know, the fun the fun guy and you know, always always had all the all the cool stuff and you know, was always looking to do something fun. And you know, he he made it out like it wasn't like it wasn't really that bad. Oh boy. Um well when he first started showing me pornography, I was about five. And then about six is when he began, was when he first actually offended me, and that continued up until I was eight, just, just before I got placed in foster care. girlfriend's daughter and things like that. I knew that nobody was supposed to know and I, I knew my dad went to jail but it wasn't like anything that like I knew was like seriously seriously wrong until later. When I was three to five years old I'm not too sure because how young I was I was molested by my dad and um, every time that it happened he would make it like it was all my fault like he would act like he would wake up and start yelling at me and uh, I remember specifically thinking that blood was white I used to think my dad's blood was white because the one time he came in front of me Michael, I'm 13. I'm here because I'm a sex offender. I have 20 victims. The males, I performed oral sex on them. I masturbated wow. them. I exposed myself to them. My name is I Jeanine. anally penetrated them. I for sexually abusing my brother. Them. I had them masturbate me. Oral sex on me. me. Performing oral sex on him. I also masturbated, fondled, and fraudulized him. Approximate number of fences is 200. I exposed myself to them. I put my hand on the butt where they were sleeping. I made my sister perform more sex on me. I rubbed my penis on her vagina and my penis in her vagina. Resident. Across the number of crimes is 350. I had a front of me and my approximate crimes are 201. And I just... There's lots of kids that we have, they, they're angry, they feel entitled, they say, you know, my life has been miserable, things have been bad for me, my mother isn't with me, my father left me, whatever, for whatever reason, they say my life is miserable, they're angry and they say, hmm, I don't care, I'm not going to obey the rules, and you know what, this child's available, and guess what, I'm going to do it, because I want to. The same girl I was acting out with. What happened to your father? We have uh, a lot of kids, a lot of kids who um, then develop real deviant kinds of sexual uh, response s systems because they, they connect violence, anger with sexuality. How about you? Why don't you? Um, the first time was with my cousin. How um, old were you? We were both five. You were five years old at the time? Yeah, we were both five. Okay. How'd you learn about that? Um, I guess it was from my, my biological dad and then I started acting out on him um, first why you, time. Why do you say you guess? Because that's where I guess I learned it from. Okay. Did other people tell you that he had molested you? Yeah, my mom told me that. How did your mother know? I don't remember. All I remember is her telling, like when I went to other places, her telling my therapist that I had before that I was sexually abused by my dad. Do you know where your father is now? Nope. Haven't seen him Most since Most sex before. offenders. Uh, juveniles uh, will have sex with almost anything that, that is warm. Uh, if they've been sexualized, they'll, they'll experiment, they'll have uh, 
contact with other boys when we've done some some comorbidity studies on kids in, in the children's home and 69 percent of the kids that were in the group had sex with their pets first when i found out about sex I um, went and peeped in my mother's room because I heard noises going on. When we look at a kid, we're going to look at their personality and going to see if there's that. conscience development, if there's been a history of violent and aggressive behavior, if there's kid is at all amenable to any sort of treatment. If we have a violent kid who's engaged in a violent crime and is engaged in aggressive behavior through a period of time, this kid uh, does not have uh, uh, much of a prognosis. Did this happen the same night? Yes, this is the same night. So the very same night you first saw this, your mother and your stepfather, and soon afterwards then you went to your room and you victimized your brother. Yes. And how long did that go on with your brother? 30 years. There's also an, an ethical dilemma that you, you, you say, gee, do I send a 15-year-old or 16-year-old kid to a, to a, a kiddie prison where he's going to be for the next five or six years of his life? That's a pretty difficult thing to do over like two months. Do you still think about your brother in a sexual way? Not as much as I used to. Sometimes you do. Yes. The other ethical dilemma is, you know, you don't want to uh, have anybody who's yes, going sir. to be victimized because you missed this kid's predatory pattern. You don't want to have to worry that you've put somebody on the street that's going to hurt another child again. It's a dilemma that we face all the time. What kind of a person was your dad? He was an alcoholic, he was a drug addict, he was abusive. Um, my father was also sexually abused when he was younger, and nobody ever really believed him. He was told he was a liar his whole life by my grandfather and my grandmother, and even though my grandfather knew what had happened, nobody wanted anything to do with it. Kind of swept it under the rug, and my dad never got any help for it. I remember this like it was yesterday, it's really weird. Um, we were sitting in the living room, me, him, and my grandfather, and they were arguing over food stamps. Next thing you know, my dad's like, you know, you never did anything for me and all this other stuff. You never do anything for me. And my grandfather's like, what are you talking about? My dad said, you know, it's just like that time when I, I came downstairs and I saw you and that guy, and then when he when he raped me, you didn't do nothing about it. And he, I mean, he used foul language, quite a bit of foul language. And um, it's cussing up a storm throwing a lazy boy chair at my grandfather and shot my grandfather in the finger. What about your mother? She had no clue. She used to just drop me off from uh, daycare. Then I would go up to sleep by my dad, and that's when he would do this stuff to me. Did you tell anybody that? No. I was too scared. I put it all behind me, and I blocked it out in my head. And uh, whenever I would have dreams or Whenever I would think about it, I would think that I was just a pervert. So you turned to your sister? At that time, I was, it was just they were there, they were available, and that's what I could get my hands on. I raped my sister. I forcefully raped her at, at one point, at, well, a lot. Um, I also have four other victims who I had sexually offended at the same time as my sister being my brother and then three other victims before that, whenever I was in foster care. Why'd you stop? I was, I got arrested. I told my one sister that um, if she told anyone uh, she would go to jail too. And my other littler sister, I just gave her like really, really dirty looks. And whenever I did that to her, like she knew that I was gonna beat her up or something. At the time it made me feel good. I knew I had power over them. I knew that I could do whatever I wanted with them. I was 12 years old and my brother had told my mother after he got caught acting out on another little girl who was his neighbor. He told my mother what had happened and she asked where he had learned it all from and he told, the, he told my mother and his father and his grandparents that he had learned it from me. The thing of like it felt weird when I first started the whole thing. But then I just kept telling myself, it's okay, it's normal. People probably do it all the time. Part of it was a lot of convincing myself that I was so, I was so much smarter than everyone around me, you know, that I wasn't going to get caught. To ensure from getting caught, you know, I used threats and bribes and, 
you know, coercion. And in my mind, I basically said, you know, as long as no one knew about it, it you know, it, it wasn't that bad. You know, I wasn't really hurting her. There's, there's a lot of, you know, different thoughts that went into it. I'm so much smarter than everyone. You know, I can stop anytime I want. You know, this will be the last time. I got investigated, and after that, I just, I didn't see my brother too often. I wasn't allowed around him really, and then I got, I started using drugs and hanging out with the wrong people and running away from my home. I started arguing with my mother, and she finally told me something my sister had said, that she could sleep in her own room now because the monster was gone. The magical question is, can they be rehabilitated? How dangerous are they? And what resources should you use to treat them? And where's the safest place for them to receive treatment? Can he remain in the home with his family safely? If he has a family, does he uh, need to go to foster care or does he need a more restrictive placement like a, a residential facility or a secure treatment facility? The most important thing is, is that you have to weigh the safety of the community uh, against the rehabilitation of the kid. These kids need to be confronted and need to be constantly challenged. You need to let them know that you've hurt people and that you've done uh, you know, something for which you need to pay a price. You can't be treating these people with kid gloves and expect to see the kind of change that, uh, that needs to occur. You know, the old saying of you can talk the talk but try to walk the walk, they may say the right things in treatment, but when push comes to shove, the danger of them recidivating and committing that act again is, is very, very, very high. Mere separation of an offender from society is not going to accomplish any rehabilitation whatsoever without some sort of therapy, some sort of counseling, some sort of psychiatric care, uh, to get to the root of the problem, there can't be any cure, there can't be any rehabilitation. Incarceration in and of itself will really only serve to increase an adolescent's risk of further contact with the law. One of the best predictors of juvenile delinquency, onset and reoffending, is association with delinquent peers. <laughs> so. If you take an adolescent who's committed a sexual offense and place them in an institution where there's no offense-specific treatment, and there are many other adolescents who've committed other crimes, we are only going to serve to increase the risk to the community. The worst thing that can happen is to have a kid who is a, a perpetrator go into a setting for treatment and end up becoming either a worse predator or a victim. Uh, you know, that's like a blueprint for total disaster. Please rise. The purpose of the hearing today is to determine whether the acts as set forth in Exhibit A have occurred. I try to keep the kids in the community as much as possible unless the level of violence is such that community safety cannot be ensured. And we can't guarantee anything. I can't guarantee anybody's behavior, but I would not recommend somebody stay in the community if I have a really strong feeling that there would be additional violence. This time I want to ask the juvenile probation office whether we're in a position to make this position. Yes, we are, Your Honor. The good news is that he has acknowledged his uh, accountability in this offense. The bad news is he's done very little about that since he became involved with our office. We have a, a whole range of facilities that we use from foster homes to group homes to secure treatment facilities where they are behind razor wire and they, you know, they're, they're locked up. At this point we're recommending that he be placed in a juvenile facility. The justice system needs to, to be real assertive in the way in which they dig for the truth. If you have a 
a perpetrator in your court, you really need to dig, you really need to try to find out who the other victims are. And if you find out who the victims are, then you need to provide services to those victims. If you do that, then you can hopefully head off some potential trouble in the future as those victims become perpetrators. I conclude that you have committed the acts of rape and involuntary deviant sexual intercourse. It's probably the most heinous crime we have in North America. It's not the kind of client group that champions the cause. There aren't parents phoning legislators and writing, you know, my son or daughter's a pedophile, I want treatment services. It's the kind that people want it to be quiet. The societal knee-jerk reaction is to catalog sexual perpetrators, put their names on lists, lock them up, and uh, there's that perception that if we can just harness the beast and lock them away, it'll all go away, which of course is mythical. some pressure to the cuff, even it out, and I'm going to release them. Test is about to begin. Do you believe that I'll only ask you the questions that we reviewed? Yes. Are you lying to your group? No. Do you have any other victims that you didn't tell me about? No. Sex offenders have been lying for most of their life. Uh, they are participating in the one activity that society will not forgive them for. Society will forgive murderers, they will forgive people who do other crimes, but society will not or is very reluctant to forgive somebody who has committed a sex offense against a child. Are you lying to your therapists? No. Do you have any other victims you didn't tell me about? No. The most difficult type in the beginning is the kid that's in denial and denies and denies and denies that he didn't do it despite, you know, numerous witnesses and, and victim statements that are very reliable. Disclosing their crimes is, is, is an integral part of their, their treatment. If you don't get them to disclose, you don't understand them, you don't understand how to treat them, and you don't understand the seriousness of their problem. When they get therapy after an incident like this, it's often the first time they've had an adult uh, to talk to about uh, these issues. And when you present the offense to them from the victim reports, there's pretty good agreement that, you know, that's what I did. The denial comes in at the next stage when you say, well, what, what was the harm done? There has to be full disclosure. As long as that person is keeping secrets, uh, the treatment's not going to progress. I've had many therapists tell me that treatment doesn't really begin until after they take their polygraph. Did any adults ever touch you sexually? No. If they're sitting in that group or they're sitting next to that therapist and still keeping secrets, the chances of the therapy or the treatment doing any good is almost none. The doctors, the, even the other group members, they knew I was lying. They knew, you know, there's a reason, you know, why you've why you've done these other things and it's not making sense and I would you know I tried to make up some bullcrap excuses or I wouldn't say anything I just sit there you know just just you know just listen to what they're saying and that's it they let my probation officer know that you know I was not being honest and that if I was to fail the polygraph that they would not keep me here there were times that I thought I was getting over on the doctors thinking that they were believing me when I would say something and deep down they actually weren't so I was being the stupid one and uh, then when the questions came up on the polygraph I was like oh no. Did you think you were lying? Oh I, I knew I was lying but I figured I might you know by chance be able to you know play it off and you know no one would know I wouldn't have to deal with you know that there were numerous other sexually deviant behaviors that I'd done. That took a long 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 time like, when I first went in, I only told what I told the guy that came over, and I only told what I told my mom. I told him about how, you know, I felt embarrassed. I didn't want to, you know, hurt my family any further. I didn't want to have to tell my mom. You know, part of it was, you know, I thought I could get away with it. It took me about a whole year, maybe even a, a little more than that, to get the whole story actually out. After about a month and a half of, you know, almost every group that I was in, you know, being focused on me and why I was lying and manipulating and, you know, not being honest, I finally came out with everything. And when I had done it, it, it makes sense now. And 
This is where I'm at now. Why did you tell us all of your fences since you've been with us? Because I wanted to get help. After like eight months being in placement, I wanted to get help. Was there any other reason that you told us all of your victims when you were in treatment with us? If they so walk out know. thinking that they fooled you about five, five times that they did something, if they have 500 crimes and they've only told you 495, they still don't feel good about themselves. They still know that they're shucking and jiving. They know that they're not telling the truth. Do you tell um, on your own free will? No. Okay, well, why I do you was, tell? Because I was basically threatened of getting placed in another placement, um, a lockdown facility and all that. Was there one single thing that made you tell the truth? The polygraph. Once they've given it all up, once they've told every single thing that they've done, then they can say, okay, let's think about this now, okay? I don't have to worry about guarding myself anymore. I don't have to worry about maintaining some sort of facade. Now I can actually start to think about, okay, everybody knows nobody shot me, nobody's killed me. Okay, it's time now. Maybe I can start to restructure. Maybe I can start to uh, rebuild. I was living with my aunt and uncle. Okay. How many crimes did you commit after that? When did you start to pick on younger children, I should say? After that? Mm -hmm. Oh my, God, I think it's around they do have to acknowledge you know, the responsibility. They have to acknowledge the level of force, the frequency, the duration, right? Um, they have to acknowledge the victim impact. But that all has to be done. There's no question. Um, I had a chance in outpatient. I wasn't complying. I wasn't doing what I needed to do. One of the things I like to ask the adolescents I work with to do is to think about what they can do to give back to their victims and or to society and other folks who have been hurt by the sexual offenses. I don't think you can ignore the sexual nature of our society in advertisements and in movies and in commercials and, and I do think that has an impact on kids when you look at video games, you look at everything and there's always there's a sexual undertone in everything. I don't know if there's more sexual acting out or if we are as a community or as a society more willing to discuss it and more willing to acknowledge the problem, acknowledge the issue. If you were to give a, a child uh, drugs, you wouldn't be surprised later on uh, to find out that at least some percentage of children who were given drugs had become addicted to it. Uh, and sex is a very powerful feeling, and if you have to begin coping with those very powerful feelings when you're six, seven, eight years old, it shouldn't be surprising that in some cases uh, children who've had that experience will be troubled and, and not managing well with it later on. They're bombarded with sexual images, they're bombarded with hormones, they're bombarded with questions. Um, very few of the kids that we supervise, if they could pick anybody in the world to be with, it probably wouldn't be a five-year-old. What kind of person do you think you are? I try to think of myself as a good person, but I know there's a lot of really wrong things I've done in my life. But, you know, there's a lot of aspects of myself that I'm just now starting to face. Two years ago, I was this mean person that didn't want nothing but what I wanted when I wanted it and didn't care how I got it. It was all about me and what I wanted and when I wanted it. And at least now, I mean, it's not great judgment. My judgment isn't perfect, but at least it's a lot better than it was. It's very difficult to look myself in the mirror and actually, you know, say, this is what I've done, this is who I am. When you realize that sex offenses are really, in most ways, not sexual, but power issues, uh, you begin to understand that when kids feel powerless, they seek that power in very bad ways. I've had kids in my court absolutely dissolve in, in tears and, and, you know, cry and, and, and wish out loud that they were either dead or different. Their family members, their students in school, their members of communities, their friends. And yes, they have committed a sexual crime and I never forget that. But if we don't treat them as human beings who've committed a sexual offense, we're never going to make a difference. You can't punish away or legislate away a different kind of sexual makeup. We've all got to be on the same side. It shouldn't be treatment versus law enforcement. It shouldn't be 
It's who's liberal, who's conservative. Every decent human being wants to protect children, wants to protect innocent individuals. Until we get beyond simply labeling and condemning and bringing science and medicine to the forefront in this area, I think we're doing ourselves all a disservice. I didn't think about how my brother felt at all when I was doing it to him whatsoever, and I didn't think about how he felt afterwards for a good year or so. My mom was suspecting that he was, um, I guess like after a while, once you're in treatment for a while, you start not feeling so, like, sorry for yourself, you know, and start looking at, like, well, what I can do, because, like, I can't sit around and be like, oh, I'm such a bad person, I'm such a bad person for the rest of my life, because I'll get nowhere. I won't have a life. I like, like, modeling, just out of scratch. Um, I like futuristic things. <laughs> I like school. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to try to do as good as I can. I have a lot of aspirations. I'm a very, I aspirate for everything. I want to be an artist. I want to be an actress. I want to be a therapist. I want to be this. I want to be that. But um, to be perfectly honest, I do not know what I want to be in life because there's too many things I enjoy. I'm just kind of open like a nice little store, you know, have a family and teach my kids, you know, be the best and I can be and you know just be there for other people where I wasn't there in the past. I'm gonna work as hard as I can to be whatever I want and I think I might be a physicist, maybe tornado chaser, I don't know.